Hello, and welcome to tonight's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Reed Albergati, and I'm a technology reporter with the Washington Post. I'm pleased to be the moderator for tonight's program on a critical topic, the historical importance of the transformation brought on by artificial intelligence and virtual environments. As we have seen so acutely over the past three months with the COVID-19 pandemic and with social media with the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and its aftermath, technology and online environments guide every aspect of our lives. Tonight, I'm pleased to be joined by two Silicon Valley pioneers to discuss these issues further, William David Au and Michael Malone. Their new book, The Autonomous Revolution, Reclaiming the Future We've Sold to Machines, is out now and delves deeply into the revolution we are living through regarding AI and virtual environments. The book can be purchased everywhere, including bn.com. A little bit about tonight's speakers. Bill David Au is the co-founder of the venture capital firm Moore David Au. Earlier in his career, he worked at Intel and is credited with being one of the pioneers in high-tech marketing. Michael Malone covered technology for the San Jose Mercury News in the 1980s and remains one of the world's best known technology business journalists. Together, David Au and Malone co-wrote the influential book, The Virtual Corporation. And today they're here to discuss their latest book. And I must say, it's a great read. Now, before jumping in, just some quick housekeeping notes. Um, questions can be submitted for the guests via the YouTube chat feature. So please post your questions there during the program and they'll be forwarded to me and then I'll get to as many of them as possible. Okay, let's jump in. Now, Bill, I wanna start with you. You helped make Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. But in recent years, you've written a lot about how the technology industry has taken a wrong turn and in many ways is hurting our world, our economy, our society more than it's helping. And what made you want to write this book and why now? Well, uh, when I was with Intel, what we were doing was, I, I've come to realize child's play. Uh, you know, what we were doing was tinkering with things. We were making stoplights work better. Uh, we made cash registers, so they added up and, and then along came the PC and we automated spreadsheets. And when you automated a spreadsheet, it went inside a business and you replaced something that people were doing with pencil and paper or uh, a, a, something like that. But the business stayed the same. And what I suddenly came to realize is that what was different about this technology was that it was transforming the form of our institutions. So that if you look at it, uh, what we did is we automated existing form. This is causing the form of the institution to change. So a bank becomes an application on a smartphone. And then I suddenly realized this had happened twice before in the history of humanity, once the agricultural revolution, and then the Industrial Revolution. And what I, everybody was saying was, well, this is just another technology change, only it's faster. And it isn't that. It's, it's a transformation of society. Now, you call that change in your book, excuse me, you call that change in your book a social phase change. And as you said, it's this rare and, and monumental thing, but can you go into a little bit of, why do you call that a phase change? And, and how is this one really uh, different than those other couple of phase changes that you document in, in history? Well, well, phase change is a, an actual scientific term and it refers to a molecule, the same molecule having a different physical form. So a storm cloud turns into a snowflake. And when water goes through a critical temperature, 32 degrees, it changes form. It goes from being a liquid to a solid. It obeys different rules, fluid flow for water. <clears throat> we use different tools on water, pumps and pipes. And our intuition about water tells us nothing about ice. And on top of that, and it comes as a warning with the analogy, uh, you know, ice breaks pipes and ice sinks ships like the Titanic. So we, we've got to, if we don't deal with these phase changes, it causes problems. 
And what I came to realize was that what was going on in society was a similar thing. Our institutions were changing form, obeying different rules. We were using different tools and our intuition was failing us. That's great. And, and um, you know, I throw this out to, to Mike, but um, let's talk about the, the moment that we're in right now. I mean, as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the intro, you know, we have coronavirus, we now have protests against police violence and racism and, and all of this together is doing a lot of, a lot of things. So one is it's kind of accelerating uh, the adoption of these technologies. I mean, we're here on, on Zoom, using Zoom right now to, to post this very uh, discussion. Um, but it's also kind of just bringing to the fore some of these issues with the technology that you get to in your book. Um, for instance, IBM yesterday uh, announced that it's going to pull out of the facial recognition business completely um, because the algorithms that, uh, that, that they use are actually discriminating against uh, people of color. So there's all this turmoil. And I just want to ask you guys, what, what effect do you think this turbulence is going to have on this technological future that you, that you outline? Did we lose Mike? It looks like it. I think we lost him. So um, I think you're more than capable of answering that question, Bill. <laughs> Gee, so. I wasn't prepared for it. I was expecting <laughs> Mike to carry the ball. But, uh, it, you know, but it, this is the, the, the type of issue that phase change uh, brings about. Uh, it, you, you, you know, in, in other words, the things, it, it, and I'm going to, switch the subject a little bit on you, but it's like privacy. Uh, it, it, you know, privacy, we used to have a door that we locked and now it, 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 privacy has a totally different meaning. And you, you have these new tools and they get used in, in uh, ways that we could have never anticipated it. I think everybody was surprised at what happened with Facebook? I mean, Facebook was supposed to bring us together, and uh, and uh, and and all I think of the technologists believed that Facebook was going to bring us together, and you know it was interesting to me because at the very time they were saying that, um, you could be reading sociology and have reached the the entirely different conclusion. <laughs> and and uh, so that I, it, one of the challenges I think that we have in Silicon Valley is that we're now at the point where we've got to be very conscious to the psychological and sociological aspects of everything we're doing. That was never the case in the past. Right, and, I, and nice to have you back, Mike. Um, you know, one of the, and one of the things you both say in the in the book is that we need to change the way that we're looking at these things. I mean, we're we're looking at them all wrong, and you know, so how are, how are we looking at this at this wrong, Mike? Can you can you? Well, phase changes, societal phase changes, are points of inflection. As Bill said, you can't predict what it looks like on the other side. If you've only lived in a world of liquid water, you live on the equator and you've never seen ice, you have no idea what ice looks like. You wouldn't even know it was water. You don't know how it's gonna behave. It has all sorts of different physical traits. Um, you wouldn't know that ice floated. So when we go into one of these phase changes, we go into an alternative reality that on the other side, Everything has changed. All the rules have changed. Things may look a lot, a lot alike, you know, buildings and everything else, but there's been a substitutional equivalence that's taken place. And what's replaced what we knew is fundamentally different. So if you were a, a herdsman out in the Levant and you came across Jericho for the first time, you might not even recognize that it was a human structure called a city. You wouldn't understand how the society was organized. You wouldn't understand anything. And it may be possible that you could never really cross over, you know, the Jordan into this new world. And we seem to be in one of these right now. 
We had another one in the 1700s. If you were out there working on the farm and all of a sudden the factories started arising and you went to work in the city, a completely new reality. And our senses, and Bill talks about this a lot, is that we have evolved. This is such a profound change. Companies, and then we turned them into utilities because it, it made sense to only have one phone company supply everybody. And uh, it, we're, we're going to have to talk about issues like that. When my, when my mother was growing up in Reading, Pennsylvania, there were three phone companies. And you, 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 if, if, if your friend was on a different phone company, you couldn't talk to him. It made no sense. And so we created a utility so we could have one phone company. And, uh, hmm. it, you know, these are the kinds of issues we're going to have to talk about. So, Bill, hmm. do you agree with Elon that uh, they ought to bust up Amazon? I, I, I have different feelings about Amazon than Elon does, but he's a very smart guy. <laughs> you know, those util those phone companies, though, they had compared to the empires that you write about now, they had a very narrow uh, effect on our lives. Right. These companies are doing everything uh, for us. I mean, they're, you know, how does that how does how how does that create differences? Well, well to me, you, you see, that is that is part of the big difference of. You know, I hear that we've got antitrust laws and things like that. Well, you know, maybe, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with antitrust laws, but antitrust laws are a technique of the past. And, uh, you know, it, we, maybe we have to look at these things differently. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it the, the reason for that is that also these are borderless institutions. And, uh, and uh, they, they aren't necessarily, you know, uh, Facebook or Google are operating in Germany. I mean, it's not like, uh, and, and, and so uh, they're an American company, but with this, this world reach. And uh, so you get into issues of, how much, what I would say, world governance do you want to have? And uh, now you may object to me talking about world governance when it, you talk about commerce, but what about cybercrime and, uh, and uh, things like that? Crime was essentially local in the past. I mean, you had to have a, you had to have a gun and an escape car. And uh, today, uh, Somebody steals five hundred million dollars. Citadel steals five hundred million dollars, and they're located nowhere. And uh, and uh, so in a millisecond. What? In a millisecond. <laughs> now you bring up an interesting question, though. I mean, even in Europe, where the antitrust laws are comparatively stronger, or at least regulators seem to have you know, more uh, power or aggressiveness and going after these companies, there hasn't actually been, there have been some big fines. But there hasn't actually been a, a, any sort of change that's, that's, that's created change in behavior of, of these companies. So does, um, does raise the question of how, how, what, what governments are um, they beholden to and, and what leverage does society actually have over these companies? Well, it's a good question. We saw the NBA, uh, you know, curl up when uh, there was a problem with China. It's a massive <laughs> investment. We know Hollywood now will not make a movie that says anything negative about China because of the massive amounts of investments. I mean, I think it's, it's all, we're already seeing the effect and it's changing what we're allowed to see in many ways or think. Yeah, you know, fundamentally, uh, I I believe what I will call the business model of the internet is, it, 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 it is wrong, and legislation could change that. You know, for example, uh, if you gave me ownership of all my personal data, uh, that would change things dramatically. 
Um, if, 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 if getting back to that writing the book, that yeah, we have to own our own data. It just seems more and more apparent. And and Bill's been a great advocate of that for years. But now I think everybody's beginning to understand that giving up our data for free for bread and circuses was a very bad contract. This is where this is where I might push back a little. The one area where I might push back on on this or prod this thesis a little bit because you know Facebook is fond of saying you know you own your own data, uh, so you know technically you do have a choice, right? I and mean, we can we can use these services or not use them. Um, so that sort of value exchange is already there. We've already all decided you know we're going to give up some of our our personal data, our privacy. In exchange for these services, but you know, I think privacy advocates would say, "Well, are, do you really have a choice? And do you uh, really know how much you're giving up, and right. where it's going?" Right. But if everyone needs to use Facebook and everyone needs to use, you know, whatever the platform du jour is, uh, do is anyone really going to have the choice to not make that value exchange, to well, not sell their data? You, you, you see, that's partially baked into the algorithm. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, we reduced the cost of one-to-many communications to zero. It used to be that you told me that I had free speech, and it's written right there. I, I, you know, I, I can say anything I want, and this, and that, and the other thing. It turns out that that's been one of the biggest hoaxes foisted on society forever. I could, I had all the free speech I wanted to, but nobody listened to me and nobody could hear me. So if I wanted to talk to a lot of people, I had to go out through mass media or I had to spend a lot of money. So free speech was expensive. And so now we reduce the cost of free speech to zero. And the thing that was limiting free speech was the free market because people had to pay for it. You had to pay to get your message out. And when we reduced the cost of free speech to, to zero, we underpriced something that was extremely valuable and we created what I would call a tool for antisocial behavior, a, 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 a product tool for antisocial behavior. And so there's nothing wrong. It used to cost me money to send a letter. There's no reason why email has to be free. And uh, there's no reason why um, reaching thousands of people on the internet has to be free. And if it cost a little bit to do that, we'd behave more responsibly. But because we're giving away something of great value for zero, we're encouraging tremendous amounts of irresponsible behavior. It's funny, we've also made, I mean, reduced the cost of free speech, but also made that irresponsible behavior very profitable for a small handful of people. Um, and to give you an idea, just how much information you're giving up, there's a gentleman named Mike Steep, former Microsoft executive. He's now head of the Digital Cities Project at Stanford. Just as an experiment. You've also kind of diminished the, the earning capacity of, you know, especially local news. I wouldn't really say the national media. Sure. Um, but local news in places like, like the publication that you worked for, um, you know, and, and how do we... Is that is it too late to, to get that back, or is there are there some ways we can change our thinking on that as well? Well, remember the newspaper is largely a phenomenon of the industrial revolution. It managed to survive, transform somewhat by the by the digital era, uh, going into television and eventually getting on the web. But the monetary the monetization model of the web broke journalism because. They started giving it away for free. And then when they tried to start charging for it again, nobody wanted to pay it. Maybe a few, you know, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. That's about it. But for the most part, all traditional media, and I'm a fourth generation newspaper man, um, they're all dying. 
they're losing their audience. They're being replaced by citizen journalism, but there are no professional standards in that world. You don't know if you can trust that re that reporter with his own website or that blogger with her own opinions. You know, it's a cacophony right now. And my hope is it begins to sort itself out as we develop feedback functions and basically make tools and techniques to determine what is real news and what is fake news. I mean, it's a tough time for a First Amendment absolutist like myself, where I think you should be able to say anything you want. But if 10 billion people are saying everything they want, now we got a mess. And that's the chaos we're in right now. Well, you know, and again, a current event here, um, you know, Donald Trump is now threatening to take away uh, the Section 230 protections from from technology companies, you know, through executive order. I don't know if that's possible legally, but he certainly has added fuel to that debate over, you know, and, and for audience members who don't know what Section 230 is, it's, you know, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act uh, basically gives, uh, gets tech companies out of any liability for what is published on their platform. That's a big difference, right, between what you did at the Mercury News, what I do, you know, I can't just say whatever I want. And I'll, I'll be sued if I, if I write irresponsible things about people. And, um, you know, is that maybe the momentum is there to get rid of that, but is that something we need to do? Well, to the problem wild? is, you know, quiz custodian, Ipsos custodians, it goes back to Rome. Who guards the guardians? I mean, what we've seen is, the tech companies trying to institute these boards and editorial censors and everything else, trying to keep the bad stuff out, let the good stuff in. The trouble is human beings have biases. Oftentimes they are unconscious of, and you can hardly say looking at the history of who gets, who gets locked out of Twitter at given times or, you know, sealed off and, and, you know, not allowed access on Facebook and elsewhere, that that has been an entirely unbiased process designed to maximize free speech. Oftentimes, the censors don't even know they're censorious. They don't know they're bringing their own political positions into the situation. I mean, if it's a choice between them picking out what we're allowed to read and just chaos, I'll take chaos. I really will. As much as I don't like it, uh, this is limiting our thinking. And when you limit our thinking and our speech, you limit our worldview. But do you think that these companies should be liable? Uh, Bill, maybe you can weigh in on that. Um. Well, we have strict and we have general liability. If a guy works on my house and he falls off a ladder, the contractor is going to get sued under strict liability. But dating back to the days of large farms, it's my house. I have to be, I'm going to be at the table in the negotiations because I'll have general liability. And I think there's some sort of new legal standard that they're going to have to abide by. We gave them carte blanche and I don't think they handle it well. They've limited speech rather than improved speech. Mm -hmm. Bill, you were going to, you were going to say something. Well, I, I, when all this, uh, about Twitter uh, putting uh, the tags on Trump's email uh, started, I had a very perverse idea. And that was, suppose that what Twitter required was for somebody to certify that to the best of his knowledge, what he had written was factually correct. And that that I had to certify that when I published something, and uh, then I thought, hey, uh, what I would be doing if I had to certify that was I was then exposing myself to some liability. Um, if uh, you know, just like a newspaper is being exposed to liability, so that I was wondering if 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 if, if Twitter couldn't have ducked the whole issue by saying, hey, uh, we're going to ask you to rate yourself and you can rate yourself as being, this is, you know, 
extremely reliable, you know, questionable or uh, strictly fiction. And you could pick one of those three options. And uh, I I was wondering if that might work. It's an interesting idea. And I guess Twitter in that scenario, they would have to know who those people are. They would have to somehow certify their real identity, right? At some point. Well, no, but the, but this is the individual certifying that. And this is the person who did the post. Yeah. Certifying that in his judgment, Mm-hmm. <laughs> th- th- this was accurate uh, or, right. or highly accurate. Uh, but if I were, but if I just wanted to spread fake news on Twitter, I could just hide behind anonymity and certify that this is accurate. No one's ever going to hold me liable, right? Well, I, 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 I it, you've got the problem that we have to figure out who you are, right? But I, 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 I on the other hand. Um, there are people who we know who they are on Twitter who mm-hmm. are uh, spreading falsehoods. And, right. uh, uh, at, 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 and um, I, I suspect they would be very cautious if they had to rate themselves to uh, expose themselves to that kind of exposure. Now, Reed, one of the things that bothers me, I'm old enough now to have seen the 60s, and I'll note that many of the people in the audience here at the Commonwealth Club are my age. If you'll remember, a lot of the good things and changes that came out of the 1960s were first verbalized by people who were shouting things that were considered outrageous and antisocial and anarchistic and everything else. And now here we are 50 years later, and we're saying we can't allow that kind of language. You know, we have to support press antisocial commentary because it's not good for us. Well, think back, folks. It was quite good for us at the time. And who are we to know now? In retrospect, we understand. What about now? In the future, are we going to look back and say suppressing this kind of con- this speech actually limited our options? Right. But, right. but at least then you knew who they were. They, they yes. weren't people who were... In the 60s, they weren't anonymous, right? They were people standing out, showing their faces and saying, you know, this is what I believe. Whereas what yeah. you have now is, uh, you know, bots and armies of trolls who sure. you know, spread, you know, disingenuous. Yeah. It's, that, it's that New Yorker cartoon that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> right. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, just to change gears a little bit, you you talk about this promise of, of technology to create abundance and energy efficiency, better health care. You know, I, I, th- I read that and I thought, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me, and maybe this is, this is the focus of, of journalists and, and we're to blame for this, but it doesn't seem to me that those are the technologies that are really being prioritized today um, in, in the tech industry. I mean, Apple, for instance, spends more on R&D in a quarter than the entire annual budget for the National Science Foundation, which you know pushes that sort of fundamental research. And I was wondering if you think that we need to steer innovation in a new direction, um, so that you know, quote unquote, utopian uh, future is is created as opposed to the dystopian ones. If that if that makes sense. Well, first of all, I, I take a little bit of issue with utopian and dystopian. I think <laughs> what we see is this fundamental paradox that Bill and I keep banging into when we read in this book, which is on the one hand, the world becomes more efficient, healthcare will be better, you know, there'll be there'll be almost no hunger in the world because we're gonna live in an era of absolute abundance when we have robots and picking fruit and growing things and controlling water and all this kind of stuff. When it's done by machines, it becomes more efficient. So the chances are the world is going to become more prosperous and more healthy. But then there's, on the other hand, there's this existential challenge, which is what constitutes a a good life? How do we live if we're not working, if we're not producing something with our lives and we're just reduced, Bill and I came up with the term ZEVs, zero economic value human beings that at some point machines are taking over more and more jobs and those people may never have a job again. So do we give them a guaranteed annual income? Perhaps, 
But if they're just sitting in their little studio apartment, which costs next to is subsidized by the government, watching a wall sized TV for free and having food delivered, is that a good life? Can can you invest enough value into that life? Yeah, you can fly a drone over Petra remotely on your wall sized TV, but is that the same? And so, I mean, this is the challenge that the paradox that we can counter writing this book. It's almost like the uh, like the time machine, the people living up in the uh, in the Grecian you know, temples and all that, they've got everything and yet they have nothing. They're slaves. They're, uh, Bill talks about the, the, the danger of robots is not mechanical robots or digital robots. It's that we're being turned into robots little by little. And that's not the future I, you know, I want for my kids or my grandkids. I wanted I wanted to pronounce Zev uh, the Z E V S as opposed to the Zevs because that's actually my son's name is Zev. So. Oh. <laughs> we'll call him I Z-E-V. thought, oh, <laughs> I hope this doesn't become a thing. Um, but you know, you 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 mentioned the word uh, efficiency there, and you know that was another I think interesting point in the book that um, you know economists have always said that worker efficiency is is a net positive right it's it's always it's always a good thing um and that isn't always the case right i mean this this uh you kind of talk about that and i'm I'm wondering if you can kind of explain that for to people why why economists might not have taken in everything into account here when it comes to the efficiencies created by these technologies well uh what has always happened in the past uh from 1920 to 1970, um, whenever we increased productivity, gross national product basically grew faster than productivity grew. And when that happened, um, wages went up and you created more jobs. But it, it, you, we were playing around with kids play for productivity. If you have massive increases in productivity, you tend to have very, very low prices and markets shrink in size. That's what's happened to publications and things like that, where, you know, one source of news satisfies everybody so that the price of news drops down and things like that happens. And so the solutions of the past just aren't necessarily going to apply in the future. And, uh, this is where the challenges arise because the way we distributed wealth for the past, I don't know, I'm going to say 400, 500 years, was we used your job as a way of distributing wealth to you. And now uh, that technique is, is, is going away. And so we're going to have to figure out new ways to handle things like that. But in the past, when we've gone through these transitions, we've always been in times of scarcity. And now the problem is that we're that these problems are being created by abundance. I mean, a, a few people can produce all we need. And so uh, we are uh, in this utopian world where uh, there, there isn't a need for us to break our backs working anymore. And, you know, and we, we certainly ought to be able to figure out a way to uh, harvest utopia from abundance uh, rather than uh, dystopia from it. Well, I wanted to um, I wanted to uh, go to some some audience questions here. And I I do encourage if you're watching on, on YouTube to, to post some questions. Um, so this one is uh, for both of you. Uh, computer science has an introductory phrase, garbage in, garbage out. How is AI software trained to deal with this constant data reality? I, um, I, I hadn't, I, I, I never thought of AI dealing with garbage in, garbage out so much as I've worried about the false conclusions or let me put it this way, the, 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 the conclusions AI reaches that 
that lead to uh, 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 just uh, unacceptable results. And, and I, I guess if I think about the fact that um, that AI is, there's a way to look at my employment record and for AI to decide that I'm unemployable uh, based on all these in reports and this and that and the other thing. And I've always assumed that that wasn't so much a problem with the input data as it was with the problem of the interpretation of the data. So I've been blaming AI uh, for misinterpreting the data more than I've been blaming the garbage that it reads. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you, have a, do you have a take on that? Yeah, one of the interesting things that's occurred because of the rise of big data and AI is that we've always lived in a world of statistics where we gather up data, a, you know, a sample, and then we extrapolate. And that's usually where the garbage outcome comes in is where we extrapolate from a limited amount of bad data and we get bad conclusions. One of the interesting things that's happening is we can now sample everything. You know, there's gonna be a hundred billion sensors out there in the water in the oceans in the air and trees we can now map every single tree in the Amazon. So the accuracy of the garbage out is, it's getting better. There's less garbage coming out. It, the, the trouble is the conclusions it draws don't include what it means to be a human being. And Bill came up with a great phrase, algorithmic prisons. And this is a terrifying thing that we isn't discussed enough, which is, our lives are now being circumscribed by AI. They take our data and they decide what we're able to do and what we're able to experience. It's most visible in China where you get these social credits and you jaywalk three times. You can't go to that concert next month. But our lives are, even in the United States, it's beginning to happen. You don't get offered that deal over here. You don't get to buy that level of insurance. All because AI has figured out that you are not worthy of buying that. You are not a safe risk. And the scary part is you don't even know that there are boundaries on your life. You think you have free choice, but those choices are getting smaller, smaller, smaller. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the garbage out that terrifies me. Mm -hmm. another, um, another question here is, what do you think will be the biggest short and long-term changes brought on by the AI revolution? Or I guess it's the AI revolution, maybe. <laughs> well, for my part, I think it's, it's each one of these major changes, these um, phase changes produces a different sense of what it means to be a human being. And I think living with intelligent machines living in this new autonomous world will change our sense of who we are. We already know it's, going to, it's already changing our sense of time and space. I mean, we have a whole new dimension in our universe called cyberspace, but it's going to change our sense of fundamentally of who we are. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, at least uh, it, it, you know, so many of us defined our selves by the job we had or by the profession we had. And I, I think that, um, that the, 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 the difference in work and the difference in the way we deal with that and the difference in the lifestyles that will come from that are are, are going to be the the uh, really important things. I mean, uh, I, I my guess is is that the fifteen hour work week might be a reality, and uh, and uh, uh, you know so uh, what do people do when they have uh, five days off a week? And, uh, and uh, you know, we're learning that we uh, have trouble dealing with that right now. Mm -hmm. 
it's interesting and i i'll I'll take more reader questions as they come in but uh, right now it's uh there's not a new one there so i'm gonna um i'm gonna ask you i mean on on that topic um you know there there is this these technology companies today are are taking advantage of this abundant labor right of of cheap labor people you know uber amazon they've really they've really kind of like seen this this uh this labor source and you know and and exploited it right and and i think that's another i mean it's like people on the one hand yes they do have more time but on the other hand they're kind of desperate for for work so how do you kind of square those two things well i i I, you know one thing you could do is is uh, give uh, earned income incentives Uh, I, i mean uh, I, I, it, it, there's there's no reason why if uh, you're earning less than fifteen dollars an hour, the, the the government couldn't say for somebody who's earning, you know, working really hard that uh, that they couldn't supplement that income. I I, I mean it, it, it and it, you know this gets back to social questions as to whether you believe that that is going to destroy the fabric of, of society. But uh, we have a problem with income inequality. And uh, it, 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 the question is, who's if you want to blame somebody, um, maybe you can blame somebody who's poor for not having the skills, but uh, or you can blame the rich for grabbing all the money. But the problem is that the social unrest we've just experienced says that life is going to be not very good for all of us unless we figure out how to solve that problem. And so we're going to have to address that problem. And uh, uh, it, we're going to have to find techniques for doing it. And so maybe uh, some kind of earned income incentive is a way of doing that. And an Uber driver if he was getting an earned income incentive, that wouldn't be necessarily a bad job. Mm-hmm. There's also the notion that what we consider non-tangible income, you know, uh, raising children, you know, coaching a, a, a girls soccer team, uh, doing community service down at the soup kitchen. Those are, those are voluntary activities that are unpaid. And we say, well, you, you get the personal satisfaction of doing good work, but in theory, those jobs could be paid too. You know, there's a lot of things we do that theoretically could be monetized in such a way that this becomes people's careers. Uh, People that can't find work because they've been displaced by AI. Uh, We don't have a model for that yet, but my sense is it's going to happen. So, you know, uh, back to some of your solutions, I, I thought some of your solutions were so radical and, and fascinating. I want to talk about a little more. Of, I mean, for instance, um, you talk about the possibly taxing companies based on the number of users they have. Um, can you explain that? What's the reasoning behind, behind that one? Well, um, it, it, you know, it, it, this, it, this got back to the fact that we had underpriced things. And um, it, it, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, not a fan of, let's say, conspiracy theory. And um, it, it, so I, 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 I thought, but there are people who engage in conspiracy theory as a business. Yeah. Um, and they, they engage in, Conspiracy theory, not necessarily because they believe in conspiracy, the conspiracies, but because they get lots of clicks can can sell the advertising. So I, I was sitting there thinking, hey, um, uh, the, you know, if you've got all these connections and if if people are so valuable that they want to connect to you, um, maybe uh, we should make connecting to you a little bit expensive, and then you could say, hey. Uh, all right, I've got lots of people connecting with me and I, I'm going to make them pay to connect with me. And you turn it into a different kind of 
business. And uh, uh, I, I, so the, the thinking behind that was that uh, if, if, if I had thousands of people who wanted to uh, read what I had written um, and they were clicking on my blog, uh, I could tax you a little bit for that and you could charge for reading your blog and it would be a, a real business. Yeah, there, there's, it's, it's all based on the, the fundamental notion Bill and I both have that the internet got created with a busted financial model right out of the gate. And the most pernicious thing that happened was the rise of freeware because it wasn't freeware. And that when you start doing freeware and you're manipulating teenage kids using techniques learned from casinos to make them addicted to the experience, there's a social cost involved. You know, that is, it, it, they are at the moment immune from, they don't have to pay that social cost. That somehow monetizing the internet in some rational way where you have to pay more taxes if you've got a bigger footprint and you're having more social impact. In other words, the number of users you have, the number of clicks you get. It, you know, it, it seems anathema to us, the idea of, oh, charging for the internet. It's supposed to always be free until the end of time. But if we rationalize the monetization of it, it structures the system in a way that ultimately becomes much more fair. I mean, it could be a tenth of a cent or a hundred of a cent per, per click, but somehow to bring a financial model to the internet that's realistic and rational and serves the larger social good just seems like a necessity. You know, we could have a micropayment system on the internet so that when I read a blog, I, I could pay you a nickel. And, uh, and I, I suspect that if you looked at a newspaper, I'm paying a nickel, a dime, or something per story I read. And uh, there, there's a reason why we don't have that system, because if we had that system, uh, the, the Google business model and the Facebook business model wouldn't work uh, nearly as well. Um, and and, and then I thought, if you think of the way the system works, you know, I have capital equipment. I've got my computer and my iPhone and my iPad and my smart car, and I drive around and I'm using my capital equipment to produce the information that you sell to somebody else. I'm a manufacturer of that. And it, 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 you know, it, it, you, you take it from me and you sell advertising and you keep all the money. And uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, so that you could conceive of lots of different business models. And I, I think, Part of the problem that we're dealing with is that we came up with a business model that distorted everybody's incentives. Well, these business models are very lucrative. And the, uh, the companies that we're talking about here have, have a lot of lobbyists and they give yeah. a lot of money to the right you know, people. And which kind of brings me to this question I wanted to kind of ask you is what is this going to take... Uh, you know, really great leadership to, to get this stuff done. And, you know, is there some technology that could invent that, you know, really good leadership? <laughs> well, either great leaders or, you know, a lot of civic strife, one of the two. But uh, this, it's, it, the system is so distorted now. I mean, we, we have allowed basically free reign to a handful of companies to grow faster and become more valuable than any enterprises in the history of the world. And we gave them carte blanche on this. And it's time to start reining them back in because they're not gonna stop. They've already shown they're not gonna stop. And their influence in distorting everyday life now is becoming, you know, almost unbearable. We know what's going on, but we can't do anything anymore. So it's gonna take great leadership or, you know, people on the streets again. And what do you think is going to come first? I mean, is it? Usually the second comes first and then a 
a leader arises for the yeah. movement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I like, like even privacy legislation, it seems like, you know, it's kind of happening on the state level uh, more than the federal level because. Yeah, once it, it has to go through K Street to make it into the Capitol and uh, the lobbyists uh, water it down on the way in. Right. You know, there's going to uh, there's probably going to have to be an enormous scandal that a whole bunch of personal information got given to the wrong person and people died. Well, didn't were, we already didn't we already have that with uh, with Cambridge Analytica? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did, but it, it we we all didn't feel it personally in our lives, feeling the, the enormous danger of the potential of all of this. One something's going to happen, you know. You can feel it on the horizon. Something big's going to happen that's going to really be damaging. It's going to People are going to rise up to try to stop these large corporations. That they're intelligent. These are smart. I mean, Bill and I have known all of them. These are smart, smart guys, men and women. They better start looking ahead and, and maybe do some things in preparation to keep it, keep it from happening. They're going to have to make some changes in the way they deal with this. So I'm going to ask one last question from the audience here. But put your uh, your predictor hats on here. What do you think is coming next in terms of of AI? Well, I, 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 I think these autonomous systems and, um, uh, you know, general intelligence uh, type things, I mean, these systems are, are going to get very smart and uh, it, it's going to be different than human intelligence. But if it's applied to a narrow application area, um, it, 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 they, they can get very, very smart and very, very capable. And uh, um, it, it, they will have very specific domain expertise and they will be very good at the things they do. Yeah, I've been tracking the semiconductor industry because it's always upstream from everything else that happens. And people aren't noticing that there have been some technological breakthroughs in quantum computing and atomic level silicon gates. And we're moving to the point where we're gonna be able to hold in our hands all the computing power that exists in the world right now. And when you harness that to AI, you're not gonna get, I don't believe we're ever gonna find consciousness in our machines, but we're gonna have incredible intellectual power in these machines, more than we can imagine They'll be moving at speeds. They'll be doing a lifetime in a second, human lifetime. And when that arrives, it's, I can't even imagine the applications that emerge, but they're going to be utterly transformative. That our, our children are going to look back on us like we look back on that herdsman in the Levant, you know, in 4000 BC. And uh, big changes are coming really fast. And they'll hit when we're, we, we know they're coming, but we keep discounting it. But when they hit, we're going to go, wait a minute, what happened? How'd that hit us so quick? And it will happen soon. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank Bill Davidow and Michael Malone for joining tonight's very interesting Commonwealth Club program. And again, I encourage you to purchase their new book, The Autonomous Revolution, available everywhere. I'll show you a picture, uh, including bn.com. And I'm Reed Albergati, and tonight's uh, virtual Commonwealth Club has been adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>